Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding is made possible by grants from AM Trust Title, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Colliers International, NYC, Cohen Equities, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handrow Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. I want to own an office condo. What's an office condo? Office condos, you can own a, a, a office in a building and you can have tax advantages and you're going to possibly make money on it? So today I've assembled basically, I consider the king of office condos, one of the leading brokers in the sale of office condos, and an individual who bought an office condo to talk about the office condo market in New York City. My guests, they include Francis Greenberger, who is the chairman and CEO of Time Equities, and as I said, the man who was partially involved with inventing the office condo concept in New York. Michael Rudder, who is a principal at Rudder Property Group. And last but not least, Robert Famelin, who is the treasurer and the CEO of Progressive Credit Union, who acquired an office condo a number of years ago. We'll talk about it. We were saying before in the green room, Francis, that the first office condo that you could remember that you weren't involved with was like in 1988. Tell me about that. Um, somebody who used to work with me, and was a good friend, David Levenstein, um, I'm not sure whether he originated the idea or the owner of the building originated it, but they decided to offer it in, uh, as office condos. I'm not sure how big the floor plate was, 5,000 feet, something like that. They've grown with loss factor. <laughs> grown with loss factor. And uh, the idea was targeting, I think, primarily uh, not-for-profits. In fact, I ran into one of the people who had bought there, who then subsequently, who was a not-for-profit, I think a, the Justice Center or something mm -hmm. like that. They sold it profitably. They bought something else. And I think he told me he just resold the thing that he bought, and he's now buying something for $25 million, or God knows what. Now, you said that you your first conversion of an office building to an office condo was at 125 Maiden Lane. Tell me about that. Well, this was a building I had owned for probably 10 years or more. And uh, for most of the time we owned it, it was full, or close to full. And uh, our main tenant there was Cadwallader, and they kept growing. This was expansion space for them. But then one day, Cadwallader decided to move over to the World Financial Center, 
which meant that our building was going to end up half empty. So I had to decide what to do about it. I could have just continued to market it as a traditional rental, uh, or we could have converted it to residential, but that would have meant vacating the rest of the building, which would have been complex. Or I reflected on David's experience and thought maybe this is a good time to try an office condo plan, which was particularly um, suitable because we knew that Cadwallader was leaving in 12 months, so we had time to market it without ha carrying it empty. And that's what we did, and uh, um, the pricing that we put on it gave us an appropriate premium above what the building was worth on a wholesale basis. So at, when you converted that 2006, so we're 11 years later, it was, you said was, the price was about $350 a foot? Yes. Currently, what, what is the pricing in that building? Well, we don't have anything immediately available, but if I had a guess, pricing would be around 650 to 750. Correct. I agree. Okay, there. so, so let's, let's talk about a number of years ago, you and I had met, and I had a friend who ran, runs a credit union, Mr. Famelin, who was upset that his landlord was increasing his rent a little too much and the loss factor. And here was a guy who was on 30, on 7th Avenue and 30th Street, who was looking to be in a space nearby. What happened then? Well, following the success of 125 Maiden Lane, uh, Francis grew the office condo market in New York by purchasing two buildings, 131 West 33rd Street and 70 West 36th Street. Um, at 131 West 33rd Street, uh, he converted an old children's wear building and had 13,000 square foot floors there that he was marketing not to necessarily children's wear companies, but other groups, nonprofits, for profits, apparel firms who wanted to own their space. And Robert and uh, Progressive Credit Union uh, saw an opportunity to purchase their space and avoid the pitfalls of renting and continuing to throw money away in rent. And he bought it, ultimately expanded. So let's now talk to you. So what happened? Well, as, as, as you said, our lease, our lease came due, and um, we could not come to a meeting of the minds with our, our previous landlord. And I saw what the landlord was asking for in terms of additional rent, and I thought to myself, if I, even if I sign this lease, I'm, gonna, I'm going to have the same circumstance in 10 or 15 years that's happening in, to us today. How do I protect the credit union from that happening again? So we started to uh, think of other options. We heard about the, the condo conversion. We, we saw the space. We actually were the tenants that purchased the space that put it over the condo uh, threshold to turn the plan effective. So for that, we got, I think, a, maybe a little better deal. Um, and it worked for everyone. You know, we gave an example on 125 Maiden Lane, 350 to about 650 today. Let's talk about you over here on 33rd Street, which is, in today, I think even much more highly desirable than before. I mean, 34th Street was always good, but today, 34th Street with the Hudson Yards, with the, you know, the, the new Penn Station plan, the Mornian Station, and the accessibility to three different things, it's even higher increase in value over there. So what happened? Well, we now? we paid 450 for naked space. Uh, my friend Dan Bernstein of Kudnicki Bernstein did a beautiful job renovating it, and now we're selling the space that we renovated plus some additional space that we purchased because we own two full floors now, um, for in the 950 range. And you're utilizing that to put into the capital of the credit union. Correct. Right. We're adding to the capital of the credit union. We're actually selling with a lease back so that we can stay in the space for another couple of years and take our time finding a new space for ourselves, probably in the same neighborhood. So he, here's the question. We were talking before. Few people realize that at the Hudson Yards, which I just alluded to, you have a building, you have one building that's owned by Coach owning their co-op condo p interest in one tower, okay? Now in the other tower, I believe it's uh, KR and Wells Fargo. Is that a, uh, th those, those are uh, much larger than the old office condos, the traditional sites, correct? 
To some degree, yes, there have been some larger office condo conversions. In fact, 633 3rd Avenue is a million square foot class A office condo on the corner of 41st and 3rd. Uh, Francis and Time Equities has owns about 30% of the building there. Um, and it's been a very successful right, office. But that was condo. an office condo where the building was a fail, was, uh, it was, was foreclosed. Was by. foreclosed. And that was an option that the, the people who took over the foreclosure saw as an opportunity. Okay. Right. And in that building, I, I happen to remember because when I was involved with First American Title, we had two right. floors. Okay. And they, it was really a worthwhile thing. What happened was the parent company in California decided to sell and to rent space. They now, sold at a tremendous profit. They sold at a tremendous profit because that building, when they went in, was a very low price option over there. And mm -hmm. 3rd Avenue didn't have much attraction. But today, who, who's buying? Okay, you have a variety of people. Who's the major acquirer of, of office condos today? For the most part, the purchasers of office condos are owner occupiers. Um, recent sales at 633 3rd include the nonprofit Smile Train, who purchased 20,000 square feet. They had been leasing space for many years on Lower Madison. They were paying rent. They were paying real estate taxes. They were paying above a base year of real estate taxes, and the taxes were baked into their lease. And instead, they saw an opportunity to purchase office space at 633 3rd. They're now exempt from real estate taxes. They won't face rent increases, and uh, it seems to be a great purchase for them. In addition, we've seen some medical groups purchase there. We've seen unions purchase. Which is the circumstance that Robert. In our circumstance, yes, it's a right. union. We've seen, we sold to a couple of uh, uh, foreign consulates mm -hmm. um, who, who, who located there. Um, we sold to the uh, Israeli. Yes, yeah, uh, ZOA. The Zionist uh, Organization of America, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a, a spectrum, and you, and, and of course, Marcus. Uh, I law mean, firm. Uh, uh, Joel Marcus bought a sure. floor. Yep. He was a law firm. and Right. I remember Salabella and Broda were in yep. your building. They were acquired by BDO. They're the positive side of the appreciation, okay, which when Robert utilized the money for the credit union, the credit union could have bought securities or other investments, right? Correct. Or made loans, which is what we would normally have done, made loans to our members. So if you had a look at it, in retrospect, your five or six year investment returned more than you would have earned during the period of time. Significantly more. Why wouldn't you maybe move somewhere else and take your profit and go into a different? We might, we have two years to think about it. I'm not sure, what, what are the tax ramifications on you selling property? Do you have to pay taxes because you're- Credit unions do not pay taxes so, on the property. So you don't have the 1031 exchange situation where you would have to buy like-kind property Correct. over there. Have you seen a number of office condo owners do that to sell their property and then move into another office condo? We have. We've seen a variety of examples of that. Um, more common is when nonprofits own buildings, freestanding buildings that are you know, desirable as residential conversions and they sell those and purchase a single floor more efficient, lower priced office condo. Um, but we see other cases where people buy a larger space and 1031 it. Okay, so let's, let's talk about some specifics today. I mean, one of the programs that you've been involved with, which was Meadow Partners, and now it's the Carlisle Group, was 866 UM Plaza. Mm -hmm. And the building was originally built uh, by the uh, the original Zeckendorf, he planned it. I'm not sure if he built it, but he he initially planned the idea. Sure. Okay, and then I think it was the Rockefeller family who built the UN and gave the land. I'm not sure who the developer was. That was an office building, and they created. They went. They decided to convert it. Why? Well, uh, Vernado had owned the building at 866 UN Plaza, which is a 480,000 square foot office building adjacent to the United Nations. Vernado always made it for, you know, the past 40 years, the home to the UN. They had about 80 tenants, most of which were uh, governments or consulates or nonprofits or NGOs that serve the UN. And it always made a sensible office condo conversion. Uh, Vernado had considered it many times, but I think decided it was kind of non-core for them. 
uh, Meadow Partners saw the opportunity to purchase the building, to convert it into 100 units, and to sell it both to the existing tenants and to the rest of the UN community. And it was very successful. I think Meadow Partners paid around 450 a foot for the building. So far, we've sold about 40% of it, averaging 1,000 a foot. Meadow sold their remaining share in the property to Carlisle, who intends to you know, continue with this office condo sales and sell out the rest of it. The, the office condo phenomena is also active in Queens, in Flushing. Any reason why the, the Asian community, Francis, loves the office condo market? I think it's just a, um, uh, I mean, the Chinese have always had a bias towards ownership as opposed to being renters. It's certainly expressed in, in, in the residential uh, sector. I mean, they view it as an investment. And uh, um, I think that with respect to commercial properties, uh, the same tradition informs their uh, actions and their, uh, um, and their appetites. So, so here's a question, Robert, you're also a lender. Progressive is a lender. You lend to individuals, entities, and so on. As a lender, how do you foresee, are you, are, would you be interested in financing acquisitions of office condos? On an individual basis, we have made some loans to office condo owners, and it's pretty much the same uh, pro forma as if they were buying any other piece of real estate. You know, the down payment, uh, you know, they have to demonstrate the ability to dem to service the debt. Um, it falls into the same uh, same sort of uh, um, package. And what's happening? How do you see the lender lender community today on office condos? I think it's one of the most important things driving the strength of the office condo market that there's such strong appetite, so such strong of an appetite for lenders to lend to office condo purchasers. Um, many of the buyers in Francis's projects and elsewhere take advantage of small business loans uh, known as SBA loans, which can finance up to over 90% of the purchase price and some of the renovation costs. Banks like Bank of America, Capital One, Citibank, are all right eager, under, under their SBA program. Under the SBA program, and sometimes under conventional loan programs, are eager to give these loans. I think that historically, the default rate on owner-occupied commercial real estate loans is very low. I read a stat recently that the uh, since the SBA program started in the mid-70s and until today through the downturn and recession and all, that the default rate is less than 2.5% on these loans. And I think the interesting thing was that even during the very difficult uh, period of the financial collapse in, in 2008-2010, um, there was still loan availability because of, for instance, this program. Uh, for office condos when there wasn't for other forms of, of real estate. Mm -hmm. So while there was a credit crunch going on in other areas, uh, there was still liquidity in the uh, office condo market because of the dynamic but, but, that Michael you know, expressed. So it's, it's, it's interesting that the world is fine on that. What, what surprises me, with the exception of the Hudson Yards, which is a specialty building where they wanted to do different ways to build the, the rest of the property, because in many cases, they're building the office so they can sell the residential and the retail uh, in a different market. Why haven't we seen recently too many conversions of office buildings to office condos? Because with the exception of 866 UM Plaza, the Corinthian, maybe that building on the west side, you know, on, in the meatpacking district, there haven't been that, I haven't seen major conversions. Francis, my you're terms, an owner investor, why? my terms, I would say leather costs more than shoes. Um, the wholesale value of office buildings, partially in anticipation of future uh, um, rent increases and due to overall cap rate compression, which had to do with the international community, investment communities' um, uh, favoritism towards New York uh, drove the value of of, of wholesale off, of of full office buildings way up, and the margin between the 
the retail mm -hmm. price of office condos and the wholesale price of buildings got too narrow to warrant the risk of going through that kind of a process. And so rental became the preferred investment properties were trading for rental purposes rather than for conversion for wholesale. So there has to be a reasonable spread between the wholesale value and the retail value to make the process uh, worthwhile for a converter because mm -hmm. there are a lot of expenses involved and uh, um, uh, the process has to be profitable. What about as a developer today, if you're in a certain marketplace and to build a building where you could do a, the total well, building is a condo? I think uh, um, there, there have been a couple of examples of that. Uh, there was the, uh, the, the building in Chelsea that... 545 West 25th Street, the Chelsea Arts Tower. Right, and then uh, the one on 40... Uh, the, in the Diamond District. Yep, Excel's uh, Gem Tower. I think, it's just from my point of view, um, I think the problem uh, uh, of, of building a, a condominium in that sense is that the liquidity and the timing of the, the velocity of the sellout uh, is um, not as immediate and as clear as a, a rental market. Right. I, I also think the uniqueness of who's build, building and developing the property. For example, the Extel building, which was on 47th Street, was geared to specifically the jewelry business, mm -hmm. okay, where they had in the building a mm -hmm. vault, a specialty vault, specialty options where, you know, jewelry manufacturers could be happy over there and have the opportunities of having everything together. It's like what they have in Flushing in certain buildings, you know, there's an accommodation. Even the medical spaces are near other medical spaces and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the, how large of the market is, um, is consumed by the medical office world? Uh, a small portion of the office condo market is medical. Um, office condos make up 10 million square feet in New York. Uh, so they're 2% of the 500 million square foot office market. Uh, and that's made up in about 100 buildings citywide. And the portion of those that are medical, I, I, I would guess, are 10% or less. Medical offices tend to be smaller, so when you add them all up in aggregate, they are a small part of the overall office condo market. And what about the, the hospitals today who are buying office condos? I think that... I mean, because I believe New York Prez recently... I'm not sure if you consider signing a 40-year lease as an acquisition or so on. I mean, in many aspects, I mean, NYU just took over one, one building on 41st Street right. where they're triple net leasing the entire building for 40 or 50 years. Call it... It's a lease, but it's really, in essence, a condo because they're not going to pay real estate taxes over there. For statistics purposes, we don't count those. Those are leasehold condos, and they're a great uh, structure. I know Durst was very successful with it on 42nd Street, where they converted an office rental building to condo units. So each unit has its own tax lot. And then nonprofits who sign a 30-year lease or longer are tax-exempt for that portion as long as they have their own tax lot there. That's really the factor that drives the length of lease, that there is a, an IRS guideline mm -hmm. that in order for, uh, or New York's, I mean, it's maybe a property tax guideline, that to be exempt, uh, the lease has to be at least more, 30 years or longer. Uh, to be treated as equivalent to direct ownership. So, see, here's a question. I mean, Robert, you were in Queens before, okay? <clears throat> Francis, you, you develop in Brooklyn today and Manhattan, okay? Most of the office condos that I see that you just put in your statistics are Manhattan-centric, correct? Mm -hmm. What about the uh, other boroughs as opportunities, especially with the booming ta boom taking place in Brooklyn? or even Queens with the boom. Do you see that as a situation? You know, I think they are uh, um, uh, viable markets. Uh, in fact, we bid on a, 
a building in uh, an office building in Brooklyn five years ago, which we had that uh, um, thought about. Um, but it was it, the pricing went beyond what we thought we could pay and resell and offer good value to to our buyers. So we stepped away from it. Um, I think maybe SL Green bought it, and I think it just retraded. Right. Um, oh, 16 court. 16 mm -hmm. court, right. So, uh, you know, I, uh, um, I think that uh, uh, there's absolutely no reason why the boroughs couldn't be a good market. In fact, often uh, the boroughs uh, tend to be more constrained than one would think. It's not as if there's a great vacancy factor in, uh, in the boroughs, uh, particularly in certain discrete locations. Um, uh, but there has to be good pricing so that we can offer our buyers a good deal. Robert, when you lent money on office condos, who'd you lend it to? Uh, I mean, we lent traditionally- it to, uh, to some, We lent it to physicians in a number of cases, and in one case to a large um, supermarket. But as, as lenders to small businesses in general, we've often seen small businesses move from a renter to an owner. And that's a, you know, a great thing. I would recommend to anyone who is a renter of a business with the option to buy and add that as another potential to your profit system, um, it's the way to go. So everybody always asks me, where is the opportunity? So where is the opportunity for somebody to buy an office condo at a reasonable price? Mm -hmm. Or or is there nothing reasonable at this time in in your mind? Because when I heard, you know, 125 Maiden Lane is, if, if somebody wanted to buy something from the units, it's $625 a foot. I think it's a relatively reasonable price. Yeah, I think if you look at replacement cost, I mean, uh, I don't know what, uh, I remember five years ago, uh, Vernado and, Others were thinking that $1,000 a foot for cost of office construction didn't seem excessive. But, and replacement cost, I imagine, today to, to, is... Today's well, cost of building an office is probably fourteen to $1,700. Right, so if you, take, if you take that as replacement cost, and then you think that you can buy a New York City uh, office at six fifty to eight fifty a foot, Relative to replacement cost, it's a good relationship and represents fundamentally good value. I think more importantly is the relationship between what would you have to pay to rent that same space, and if you look 10 years down the road, at the end of that 10-year lease with potentially an option or maybe no option, where might you be? That was one of the, uh, one of the computations that I did when we bought. I said, here's where I'm going to be in, in 15 years if I rent, and here's where I'll be potentially in 15 years if I buy, and, and my expectations were exceeded because we were fortunate enough to buy in 2009 when the market was low, and we're making a decision to sell now when the market is higher. Right, so I think in summation, one has to evaluate the, all the rules and see what happens, but in essence, it seems like it's been a good investment, it seems it's gonna continue. And certain people could use it even better, as you said. Nonprofits, mm -hmm. you know, moving out of their other property to move here and not pay taxes is important. I'd like to thank Francis, Michael, and Robert, and I'll see you next week.